what what you eat is what you are so uh, menopause is such a hot topic in the workplace there was, was, um, there was um, in the telegraph and the times the other day was about how the hormones affect your brain and what you eat is what you are and the quality of your body at this time is how well you're going to be in your future so it doesn't only just affect your mood it affects every cell and structure in your body so with that i'll pass you over to fiona thank you very much everybody okay thank you for that and an apologies for that blip at the beginning i think with us all working at home in this last 18 months we're kind of used to a bit of technology issues but i must apologize so i'm hoping there's no more issues for now okay Thank you um, for joining us this evening on this really lovely evening where I'm pretty sure you'd rather be spending more time in the garden. So I really appreciate you taking some time out to come and listen to me talk to you tonight about the menopause. Um, yes, it's that lovely subject that unfortunately all women have to go through. Um, so I just wanna say thank you. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Let's hope there's nothing else. Um, goes wrong here yeah. oh, and I don't know why I have got this in the middle of the screen here oh. I'm not sure we can see what you're seeing Fiona I can just see, oh, so you screen. Can see my slide <laughs> yes. Is that okay that's that's good because I've got a big black box with tabs in the middle that I don't know <laughs> you just decide to do to go into menopause meltdown I think um, just before we came on so anyway anyway so before I start I just briefly want to introduce myself my name is Fiona Hutchison I'm a registered nutritional therapist that mainly specializes in female hormone balance so that's anything from PMS you know heavy periods non-existent periods um, endometriosis PCOS right through to the menopause get the picture. Um, I've been qualified um, since 2018, so it's coming up to um, three years. I studied at the College of Naturopathic Medicine in Manchester, or CNM as we called it, where I studied um, a three-year diploma in nutrition. Um, and I'm delighted that I'm actually the nutritionist that's based at the lovely team at Lynn Moss in public practice, and I'm really pleased to be part of that team. And hopefully help a lot of clients along the line. So tonight I'm going to be talking, as you know, about the menopause. And I'm specifically going to be talking about how diet and lifestyle can really help you to manage your symptoms, as I guess that's, that's why you're all here. So you'll probably be familiar with um, some of these symptoms that I'm going to mention. Um, Brain fog, anxiety, irritability, hot sweats, fatigue, um, brain fog, forgetfulness, night sweats. I think you get the picture and I'm pretty sure you're finding that, that these are, you know, familiar. So let me just click on. Yes. Excuse me. By the way, I've done these slides myself, so they're not the best in design, but, you know, I've done the best. Welcome to the seven double of menopause. You've got itchy, bitchy, sweaty, sleepy, bloated, forgetful, and psycho. Does this ring any bells with anyone? Um, all jokes aside, you know, um, these are symptoms that are really common to women, and they're not funny. And you're not alone. Menopausal symptoms are extremely common, and it can really affect how women feel about themselves. Um, women going through the menopause often report a loss of confidence, a loss of self-esteem, they don't feel likeable anymore or fun to be around, and they also can feel extremely embarrassed, particularly if you're getting one of those horrible hot sweats right in the middle of, of work, or you suddenly can't remember what you're going to say in the middle of an important meeting. And I was reading some research recently that stated that nearly 80% of women had said that the menopause had changed their life in some way, or they had to change their life to adapt. Um, and nearly half of them said that it affected their 
um, life in a negative way. So for example, affecting their work life, social life and relationships, <coughs> excuse me. And I know um, in my family, um, my aunt, um, when she was going through it, unfortunately the menopause contributed to the breakdown of her marriage. So it's not fun and um, you know, we all have to go through it unfortunately, but there is hope. So I just want to share some interesting facts with you. So did you know that in Japan, they don't actually have a word for menopause? In fact, 90% of Japanese women don't experience many, if any menopausal symptoms. And they've also reported that the only menopausal symptom is a loss of the periods. And it's thought that this is actually down to their diet and lifestyle. So what I'm trying to say here is, ladies, that it can make a huge difference and there is hope. So stay tuned. Okay, so you might be wondering why I'm showing you a picture of an orchestra. And it's because I briefly want to talk to you about how our hormones work. And I think it's important because I think it'll give you an understanding of when I work with clients, uh, why I ask them to do the things that they, they do. Um, and it's also important for you to know that yes, the menopause is about declining estrogen and progesterone levels. You'll have heard that, everybody's aware of, you know, the estrogen levels drop, but that isn't the only hormone that is involved. Um, our hormones don't work in isolation. They actually communicate with one another and they affect one another, excuse me. <clears throat> and this is why I put the picture up of an orchestra because you will know if you've ever been to the theater and those times when we could go to the theater um, and you've seen an orchestra playing and there's all these different instruments that are in an orchestra and when they're all playing together and it's all working lovely, it sounds lovely. However, it only takes one instrument to either not be in tune or in the wrong rhythm and it affects the how the whole thing sounds and that's how our hormones work. It only takes one of our hormones to go out of balance in whatever way, too high, too low, whatever, and it has a knock-on effect in all the rest. So that's one of the things that I really want you to think about and take away. So when I work with ladies that are going through the menopause, these are the hormones that I tend to focus on. Estrogen, progesterone, insulin, cortisol, and thyroid hormones. Because it's only when we get those hormones into balance that we'll be able to reduce our menopausal symptoms. You know, the hot flushes, the night sweats, um, the weight gain, they're really important, okay? I hope everybody's with me. <laughs> so when I work with ladies, I like there's four key areas that I work with because yes, I am a nutritionist, but I also focus on lifestyle as well because we have to do everything together um, for, for to get the best results. So the four key areas that I, I address are on the screen. It's stress, nutrition, exercise, and toxins. And toxins I'll go on to talk about later on. <clears throat> and it's only when we can get those areas of our life in balance that our hormones will truly come into balance and we'll begin to feel better again. So you might be surprised to think that the first area I'm going to briefly talk about is stress. And yes, I've experienced acute stress about 15, 20 minutes ago when I didn't think I was going to be able to join. So I know how this feels. And yes, I do focus on the nutrition side, obviously, when somebody comes, comes to see me. But stress is one of the key areas that I focus on first. And I'll tell you why. Stress affects our health dramatically um, and particularly our hormone health. And one of our main stress hormones is cortisol, which I mentioned earlier in the previous slide. And cortisol um, is a survival hormone. We can't live without it. It's the hormone that will keep you alive when you're faced with a dangerous situation. We can't live without it. And because, and so we're chronically stressed, which a lot of people are, and a lot of people don't think they are, but I'll talk about that in a minute. 
Making cortisol is very nutrient intensive. It requires a lot of nutrients to keep this hormone in supply. So you can be eating all the right things and your diet can be absolutely amazing. But if we don't address your stress levels, no matter what you do, eat wise, you will never get your hormones back into balance and you won't see results. So that is why I focus it as one of the key areas. You know, stress is part of our lives. There's no getting away from it. And a lot of people, I had a client recently that said, oh, I'm not stressed. Um, and, I, and then she went on to talk about her busy job, caring for her elderly patient, her parents, dealing with young children. She was making four different meals every night. She was, she was at her wit's end. She had to-do lists as long as her arm. And a lot of people think that it's an emotion and stress is an emotion, yes. But it's also, I guess another way of putting it is what is your life load like? And we're so, as women, we juggle so many plates in the air and we're frightened to drop one and we never take time for ourselves. And to me, that is stress. Now, when you are doing those things, you're in a stress state and your cortisol levels will be pumping because our body can't distinguish between what is a real threat, i.e. getting hit by a bus or, or eaten by a saber-toothed tiger, and what is a perceived stress. And this perceived stress are the to-do lists, the working long hours, the drinking lots of alcohol and caffeine, the um, not sleeping well at night, those are all stresses that we need to address. Does that, I'm hoping this is all making sense to everybody. I hope so. Okay. So this is, excuse the diagram, but I'm just trying to explain why it's important that we get our stress hormones into balance. When we release cortisol from our adrenal glands, when we are stressed, it triggers the release of glucose into our bloodstream. And glucose is our body's primary source of fuel. It's the one that it likes to use to power our muscles so we can run away or fight. It's the fight or flight mode. Um, to get glucose out of our bloodstream and into our cells, we use insulin. This is why I mentioned insulin earlier. Insulin will then transport that glucose into our cells. And when the cells have got enough, it will then say, okay, well, let's store the rest in our muscles and our liver as glycogen. But they become full quite quickly. And if you've not used that glucose up, what it will do is rather than get rid of it, it'll say, hang on, I want to keep hold of that because I might need that later. So it converts it into fat and you store that fat around your middle. So, you know, you might be thinking about that spare tire that quite often comes in our like 40s or whatever. And, you know, it's a muffin top. And that's when you might need to start thinking about how stressed we are because stress can lead to weight gain. The other thing that's important to, to understand is that when we go into menopause, our body, Mother Nature thinks it's doing us a favor, but it's made us a little bit more insulin resistant. So what that means is that our cells don't really listen to the insulin signal anymore. And it makes us put on weight. And the reason for this is, is that we can actually produce estrogen from our fat cells um, via a process called aromatization. It thinks it's doing us a favor because it's thinking, hang on, the estrogen levels are falling in the ovaries. So why don't we give her a helping hand and make it from the fat cells? Now that might have been fine in the 18th century when food was scarce and people were a lot more active, but obviously in the 21st century, in age it's not so great we've usually got enough stores so so that is one of the reasons if you've got high stress levels and then you've got insulin resistance you're going to get that weight gain the other thing that's important to know is that cortisol can also affect your thyroid gland so if you're chronically stressed and you're pumping out all this cortisol your thyroid can be impacted and I don't, there might be some ladies on here that actually have issues with a low functioning thyroid. It, it is fairly common. Um, your thyroid is res hormones are responsible for your metabolism of your um, body. So when it's not working as well, um, we get things like weight gain, um, brain fog, 
um, you know, you feel cold, um, you know, digestive issues, constipation and heavy periods, for example, as well. So this is why I focus on not just estrogen and progesterone. We look at all the other hormones because they have a massive impact on our symptoms and how we feel in general. Okay. So there's no getting away from stress. Um, we have to learn to manage it. And this is really, really important. And a lot of women are not good at it. They um, think that um, usually the last person that you know will give time to, you're too busy focusing on everybody else. And so it's really important that we practice some self-care. So that is doing something for you every day. Um, <clears throat> I spoke to one of my clients today um, to see how she's getting on. And she was telling me that she'd been to the supermarket because I'd given her a shopping list and things to, that she could buy. And she said, do you know what? She says, Fiona, it's a really strange experience because I don't really do the food shopping for me. She says, I do it for everybody else in the family and I just, just have what, what everybody else is eating. And she says it felt like a real novelty and a real luxury because I was actually buying food for me. And I'm thinking, yes. And we need to be doing a lot more for you because we need to be reducing those stress levels and putting you a bit for more first. And I don't want people to feel selfish or guilty about that because we can't pour from an empty cup, ladies. We, if we're going to be look after everybody else, we need to look after ourselves first. So take time out, you know, in your day. Find something that you enjoy, that you find that is relaxing. It could be reading a book, going for a walk, um, any of those things but it's really really important that we learn to manage stress because it's not going away and this is the kind of life that we lead um, a lot of people um, like yoga um, meditation is a really good one and it's not sitting under a tree chanting on it can be if you want it to be but it's really really good these days um, um, meditation obviously there's a usual avoiding caffeine and alcohol or at least reducing it significantly because they can cause stresses on your body and that cortisol release and, of, and prioritizing our sleep. We're not sleeping enough. And um, so making sure that you get in that rest and relaxation. And that is why I have put stress first because it's so important. Okay, so now the nutrition bit. So what about to say next is actually quite important and um you might feel a bit a bit uncomfortable with it um to truly balance our hormones we need to start seeing food not as calories but as information food has the power to change how we look how we feel how we think and how we perform and it does this by sending messages to our cells and hormones so it can tell your body to burn or store fat, um, to increase or decrease your energy levels, to alter your mood and to change your brain function. So we want foods that are gonna nourish us and our hormones, and we don't count calories. I see so many women that are focused on how many calories they've had that day. And I really want you to stop doing that if you do do that. Um, we need, I want you to start looking at your food and seeing how many nutrients it, have, it has in it, how nutrient dense they are, not how many calories, what nutrients they have. Because when your body has got the right nutrients and they're plentiful, it will find balance itself. And when that happens, your body will relax. Nutrients are plentiful. Your body will release that excess weight and your metabolism will be restored, giving you much more energy. And dietary stresses that I see regularly, which I want you to maybe not do, are things like consuming the wrong foods, so processed foods, sugar, all those kind of things that you'd expect me to say, overeating, because we, you know, we don't need to overeat, skipping meals, and they can all have an adverse effect on our hormones. Okay. So the nutrients, nutrition to nourish our hormones. So what I tend to do with my ladies 
is we focus on consuming low glycemic load food. So you might have heard of glycemic index. So for any of you that don't know, glycemic index, the food, different foods are given a rating and they're based on how quickly they're actually broken down and release sugar into our bloodstream. So for example, um, white bread is very high in the glycemic index because it's broken down very quickly and releases glucose into our bloodstream, which can spike that insulin, you know, that fat storing hormone that I talked about. So you can get um, many books on how you can do this. I've got one here that I, I recommend. This is Patrick Holford, which is the low GL diet cookbook. And that's got loads of really good recipes in there. And you, you know, you feel full for long, but, but this actually stops um, those, you know, those insulin spikes. And um, when our insulin levels are in balance, it will stabilize our cortisol and our sex hormones, which will lead to better sleep, better mood and reduce symptoms. Along with that, I always ask my ladies to consume good quality protein with every meal. So that's breakfast, lunch and dinner. And proteins are things like meat, fish, poultry, eggs, um, beans, legumes, nuts and seeds with every meal because protein takes quite a while to break down and it helps to stop that insulin spike and it keeps us fuller for longer. So you're less likely to want to snack. Um, and protein is the building blocks of our body. Um, it, makes every, it makes loads of things. It's not just, you might've heard of protein in terms of muscles and things like that, but our antibodies are made from protein. Um, everything is made from protein. So, and I see a lot, particularly vegetarians and vegans that really don't eat enough. So it's really important. Eat the rainbow. I tell everybody to do this. And what I mean is consuming different fruits and vegetables of every color on the spectrum, because these vegetables and these fruits contain phytonutrients that your body needs to work optimally and function properly. So I always ask people to try and eat um, fruit or veg, two fruits a day, the rest is veg um, with every meal um, and to make sure you're getting variety and the colour. And you'll be, you'll be surprised at how different you can feel when you, when you do that. Um, now this can be a controversial one, fat. This is another one that I see uh, um, lots of people doing, avoiding fat or having low fat. Um, again, I don't want you to do that. Now, what I'm talking about is good health, good healthy fats. I'm talking, I'm not talking about um, trans fats or fried food or hydrogenated fats. And this is an excuse to go down the local fish shop, fish and chip shop and just don't say, well, Fiona said that I can eat loads of chips and I can get the bags of crisps out. You know, that, that isn't what I'm talking about. Um, our hormones are actually made from fat, um, believe it or not. And we've got fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. So they need fat to be absorbed into our body. And every cell in our body has a fat membrane. So fat's really important. It's really important. And quite often, if you've got dry skin or you've got cracked heels or, and it, it can be a sign that um, you're not getting enough essential fatty acids in your diet. And it's something <laughs> that I always look for when I'm working with clients. So, you know, make sure you're having things like good quality olive oil, avocados, nuts and seeds, oily fish, uh, and you should feel the benefits. In fact, um, there's some research that suggests that in um, countries where they eat the most oily fish, they have the lowest rates of depression because our brain is actually made 60% um, fat and our brain needs that fat to work properly. So, so please don't worry about about fat, um, it's, it's sugar that we need to be concerned about, if I'm honest. Um, um, cruciferous vegetables are another important um, food that we should be consuming, particularly for our hormonal health. And the cruciferous vegetables are things like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, rocket, Brussels sprouts, kale, um, 
all those if you google it you'll you'll see the whole lot but but they're really good at helping our liver to detoxify our estrogen so quite often in the beginning phase we can have high levels of estrogen uh, compared to progesterone and these are things that can cause things like really heavy periods um when you're going through the menopause um so it's really important that we get loads of those vegetables in probably two portions a day i would say um to help you get rid of those spent hormones that you don't need anymore. And the last thing I'm going to talk about is phytoestrogens. You may have heard of women taking soya um, for menopause and how it reduces their symptoms. And, and this is um, one of the reasons why I think the Japanese women um, have very low menopausal symptoms because of the amount of soya that they have in the diet. Now, I'm not a huge fan of soya, if I'm honest. Um, not, not from this country anyway, um, because it tends to be genetically modified and not its complete form. It can be a so soya protein isolate, which isn't the best and tends to be non-organic as well. So if you're gonna eat soya, make sure you have good quality soya, um, preferably organic and you know it's not been messed around with. Um, but also quite often people can react to soya. It can be one of those things that can be a food sensitivity or the allergic to. So other things that I recommend are things like flax seeds, um, lentils, um, miso, tempeh, um, tofu, edamame beans, things like that. There's quite a lot of variety. So it's quite good to get those into your diet. Um, okay. So... I just wanted to put this couple of slides in to show you um, how a lack of nutrients can cause symptoms. Um, so I've just used three one, three here. So you've got your B vitamins. We need B vitamins for loads of things. And I quite often see people that can be deficient in them. And if you are deficient in B vitamins, and if you drink a lot of alcohol and B, because it, it tends to get, you know, burnt up up with it and also if you're stressed a lot you burn through b vitamins and magnesium and you know when you haven't got enough you can experience anxiety low energy increased stress poor sleep etc and um, so you know that's why it's important that we get in a wide variety of food to make sure we're covering all the nutrients i mentioned essential fatty acids earlier and how that can cause dry skin aching joints a key symptom in menopause um, you know, memory issues, as I mentioned, your brain is 60% fat. So it's really important that we have these essential fatty acids in our diet. And finally, magnesium is another one that I think we don't get enough of. And um, I don't feel we get enough of it in our diet. And magnesium is really important because it's nature's tranquilizer. It's actually very good at calming our nervous system down um, and keeping us a bit more calm. Um, so... And quite often people that suffer from migraines can be magnesium deficient. It can affect our sleep, our mood, and again, cause anxiety issues. So I just wanted to put those in there just to give you an idea. This is just some food sources um, where you can get sort of a range of, of, of vitamins and minerals from. Um, I don't think it's rocket science and you can always um, ask me, um, but you know, just to give you an idea of where you get these things from. Okay, moving on, exercise. Now I'm not talking about spending hours pounding in the gym or going for a 10 mile run off. That's, that floats your boat, then you go for it. I'm just on about us being a little bit more active than we are. Um, and you may already be active, but exercise is really, really important to this phase of menopause in our life um, because if we go on to the benefits, the key benefits of exercise, and it can be things like walking for half an hour a day, gardening, um, just using the stairs rather than lift, just being generally more active. Um, it helps to bring our cortisol levels down. So cortisol, I mentioned previously, oh. being that stress hormone. Um, now, if you are an exercise junkie and you're exercising loads, and loads and loads and I do see people like this and um, that can have the opposite effect it can actually raise our cortisol levels because exercise can be a stressor so I'm just on about you know three to four times a week making sure that you're active or try and be a little bit active whether it's a walk every day it's really really beneficial 
I talked about insulin earlier and how we become a little bit more insulin resistant when we reach this phase now. Exercise is really good to help our cells become more sensitive to that insulin and start to listen to it again, which will help to with our weight. We eliminate and we detoxify when we exercise because we sweat. And I'm going to talk briefly about toxins shortly. Um, and this is a way of getting them out. Um, that's why um, in Sweden, they're quite big on um, saunas. And there's now things like infrared saunas because they're very good at for detoxing um, and getting rid of all those, those toxins that we don't need. The next one's really important. Exercise supports our bone health. And you will probably have heard that when we enter the menopause or become postmenopausal, um, we're at higher risk of osteoporosis. And that is because estrogen is protective for our bones. So when we lose that estrogen, our bones have a tendency to become a little bit more fragile and, oste and we can get osteoporosis. However, by doing exercise and particularly things like strength training and weight bearing exercise, so squats and uh, maybe um, weights or just doing some really good walking where you're actually um, putting a bit more stress on the bone can help to build the bone up and be protective. So that's really important. Obviously, um, exercise helps with weight loss. Um, that's one of the reasons why many people do it for managing weight. It helps with heart health. It's a no-brainer there. Um, again, when we're postmenopausal, we're at a greater risk of heart disease as women. And it's also good for our mood. So exercise is a really good thing. And it's something that I work with with clients to make sure they try and build into their lifestyle. And finally, I'm going to talk briefly about toxins. This is something that I focus on with clients. Um, when we've got the diet and the lifestyle and the stress you know then start to look at this and it is important when it comes to our hormones we live in a world that is becoming extremely toxic and i read an article recently that said that we're exposed to over eighty thousand toxins circulating in an environment and i also read recently that women before they leave well in the, in the days where we would leave for work um, if you think about it, they'll have a shower, they maybe use shampoo, conditioner, body wash, body lotion, deodorant, makeup, hairspray, you know, and then they might do some cleaning around and they expose the chemicals before they've even left the house. And that isn't taking into account the food that we're eating. If you're eating food, that food and vegetables have more than likely been sprayed with fungicides, pesticides, insecticides. Um, if you're eating non-organic meat, you know, quite often they're treated with antibiotics and, and hormones and other things. Um, so we're, we're extremely living in a toxic world and we're also storing things in plastic. We know that plastic's really bad for the environment. It's also really bad for our health and our hormonal health because it contains um, chemicals in them that are, can mimic our estrogen they're called xenoestrogens and actually it's one of the reason why they think that young girls now are now getting the periods a lot younger um, because they're being exposed to estrogen and it's triggering earlier puberties um, you know which is quite worrying so it is real they are real um, so we need to think about the chemicals we're exposing ourselves to and the impact that that's actually having on our hormonal health so just got a few ideas together so it might be a good idea to think about your natural sw switching to natural personal care products and cleaning products so for example i use quite a lot of tropic you might have heard of tropic that's all natural and really good um cleaning products um i use method and e-cover and think because it's also good for the environment as well as our health uh, you don't have to all do it at once because obviously that would cost a fortune and um, what I encourage clients to do is when they finish one product, maybe replace it with something that's a bit more natural. Um, I wouldn't go down using air fresheners and scented candles. Yes, they smell lovely. Um, but again, you're putting those in the environment and you're breathing them in and they can be having a negative impact on your health. Please avoid using and storing food in plastic and particularly heating them in your microwave. Um, they call 
they those when you heat the plastic up um the the chemicals leach into your food and then you're then consuming that the microwave i really encourage you to take Take the food out of the plastic tray and transfer it into ceramic or a glass dish before heating it up and try and reduce your exposure to those. It's, it's really not good. You could try and filter your water um, as well. And I always advocate where you can eat in organic because you're reducing your exposure to all those insecticides and things. Okay, so I've talked a lot tonight. Um, before I finish, I'd just like to add that for anyone that is struggling, it can be a real challenge to implement all these changes into your diet. And quite, this is a different forum for me. Usually I'm used to standing up and talking in front of people. And of course, the world that we're living in now, um, we're not doing that. So what I would say is if you are struggling or you just want to have an informal chat with me or email me, I put my details on there. Um, it's you know, there's no obligation. You don't have to book an appointment with me. But if you just really do want to have a chat about what you could maybe do um, to how you could feel better, please don't struggle and, you know, don't suffer in silence because it, it isn't fun. Um, if you do email me, I just want to know there's no N between the I and the S. Often people in sin and then I don't get the email. It's just sin and mine down there. So if you want to take a note of that, please feel free to get in touch. Okay, so that's me done. So, any questions? We've got a question in the chat for you, Fiona. Um, so somebody's yes. asked, can you substitute ordinary coffee with decaf coffee uh -huh. and will that still reduce stress? Okay, so, so um, Yes, you can, but I'd go for a decaf coffee that is not using chemicals. You can get, um, it's filtered with water, and I can't think off the top of my head brands that, um, that do that, but you can get them, and they're better for you. But ideally, what I'd really like you to do, and I see this a lot, I see people drinking coffee a lot. It's a big part of our culture these days, is maybe try and reduce it anyway. Um, just maybe. Maybe if you're having, I don't know, three, try and reduce it down to two and then we try and re reduce it down to one. I love coffee. I do drink it, but I have one a day and I have it in the morning if I'm having caffeine. But yeah, you can use decaf, but try and use the water filtered um, stuff um, because they use a lot of harsh chemicals to actually extract the caffeine out of the coffee bean. Fiona, okay. is there more, well, more caffeine in like an espresso than there would be in like a latte or is it all just the same? I think it's just all the same. It's just, it's a bit like alcohol. You know, if you think about it, you pour yourself a load of tonic in or you can put a little amount, you know, it's still going to be the same amount of, of caffeine. But also a lot of people um, can't metabolise caffeine very well. Um, you know, you see that makes them jittery and you also have to think about Caffeine's not only in coffee, it's also in chocolate um, and other things too. So, so, you know, you just really want to be aware of it because, and if, if you're struggling with sleep, which a lot of ladies in the menopause are, then it might be worth challenging yourself and taking yourself off that caffeine for a while and seeing if it makes a difference. Quite often it does. It also causes hot flushes like you wouldn't believe. Um, and anxiety. I had a client that I worked with last year that was drinking a lot of coffee and she was going through the menopause and she'd noticed that her anxiety levels had reduced, had increased a lot. And um, she reduced her coffee and the anxiety went. So it's, you know, our hormones are changing and how we used to be able to deal with things in our 20s and our 30s, um, caffeine and also alcohol we can't do so much when we're in our 40s and 50s and unfortunately it's rubbish I know you really want that glass of wine you really want that coffee I'm not saying completely take them out but we just need to be a little bit more um, aware of how they may be negatively impacting on how we're feeling any more Fiona I, I found drinking rubbish vanilla rubbish dragonfly um, yeah and really helped me you know you know sort of an also you know i found my taste buds completely changed which helped you know sort yeah. of you know sort out 
you know what worked for me at that time you know because some yeah, yeah it's they amazing can't, they can't drink red wine anymore and can only drink red white wine you know sort of so it, it's a it's a it's a journey of discovery isn't it really what it really is is and of course you know it's not a one-size-fits-all approach either um i find this when, when i'm working with clients because well, I do recommend supplements for people not straight away but one supplement will work amazing with one lady and then it won't work at all with the other it's trial and error with a lot of things we're all biochemically individual so you know I do tend to work with ladies and make sure it's a personalized approach for them so yeah yeah we're all different and you know some will be fine with red wine and others really won't unfortunately yeah, no, I'm a, bit, I'm, I'm a bit of a snacker. What would you recommend? Because um, probably my favourite snacks would be crisps, but I know they're really bad for me. Um, what would you suggest to substitute, you know, if, you're, if you can't resist the urge to snack? Well, one of the things that I would do with you, Sharon, is I'd probably look at your, the, what you're eating for your breakfast, lunch and dinner. Um, because if you ask... Because usually if we've got the right balance of carbohydrates, fats and protein, then you probably will find you don't need to snack. Um, I try and avoid people snacking if possible, um, because, you know, we want that. I talked about that insulin and when every time we eat, our insulin goes up and then it comes down. And if people are snacking, it's going up and down a lot. Um, so really, you want a really good balanced meal and see how you feel. Now, if you're really struggling and you really want those that snack, then nuts are really good. I mean, I know people think, oh, it's full of fat, but actually really good. And you have it with a piece of fruit or you can get things like kale crisps, <laughs> which might sound absolutely horrible, but they're absolutely delicious. Even my 10 year old eats them, she loves them. And they're really easy to make. And really Moorish, you know, I have got, I do give handouts out that have um, a list of alternatives that people can try if you've really got the urge. But the other thing I would say as well, you know, I'm not after perfection when I work with people, I'm just after consistency. So if you really want a bag of crisp, then have it, have it. Maybe not every day. I work to the 80-20 rule um, because nobody wants to live a miserable life where they feel like they can't eat anything. So, you know, if you really want that bag of crisps, then have it and really enjoy it. But then make sure you maybe have something different another day. You know, that's also really important. We have to enjoy our lives as well and not worry about the, the negative impact I think you might be having. If you want a piece of cake, make sure you eat that cake and you enjoy every single mouthful. And then when you've had it, you think, yeah, I'm satisfied that tomorrow will be a different day. That's how I also work too. I'm not, I'm not absolutely going to tell you, no, you can't have that, or, you know, I don't work like that. You know, I understand we have to be realistic, right? You know, we live in the real world. And I enjoy crisp, and I enjoy a glass of wine too. So, you know, we're all, we're all human. Anything else? Just on the um, fruit side of things, um, and sort of tied in with snacks as well, um, are dried fruit bad as snacks? And because I find eating fruit, like big pieces of fruit sort of quite hard work. Yeah. The problem with dried fruit is that they're very, very high in sugar. Um, that is the problem with them. I mean, you could work that they're better than that bar of chocolate, but I would maybe um, not have it as often. And the dentist would kill you because the, I remember my daughter went in with a bag of raisins I was thinking this before I trained thinking I was really good and I got told over by the dentist for making her have raisins because it was going to ruin her teeth um but yeah they're really high in sugar they're really high so they can spike your sugar levels quite quickly so um but as I say everything in moderation I just wouldn't have it all the time um I quite often with fruit because I, I talked about glycemic index earlier on and the things that I really focus on are the berries at the moment because they're quite low in sugar um, and they're in season at the moment so strawberries blueberries blackberries you know all those raspberries all those are really good uh, you know and it's quite easy to put those on your breakfast and things like that at the moment uh, you know in the morning and but I always just 
advocate just two portions of fruit a day because at the end of the day, it does have sugar in it. And we really want to keep those sugar levels down because they're not great for hormone, hormones, unfortunately, and keeping our hormones in balance. Does that answer you? Yeah, question? that's great. Thank you. Anything else? Um, Fiona, can you give me your email address again, please? Yeah, let me just go back if I can. Previous. So it's Fiona M. Hutchison. Yeah. And there's my mobile number. I'll keep that up okay. on the screen if anybody else wants to just take those down. Um, as I say, you know, normally when I do a talk, um, I hang around afterwards and people want to come and have a chat to me. Mm -hmm. um, if they've got any questions that they maybe don't want to ask in an open forum, I completely understand that. And as I say, because we're doing things on Zoom now, it's difficult for people. So if you do want to give me a call or drop me a text or email, I'm, I'll be very happy to have a chat with you. OK, thank you. Everybody okay. will be getting um, a follow up email tomorrow. But as we've recorded the session, um, which I'm going to just stop 